All right, Jesse. So the big question that I have for you is what is a sinking fund? Well, to put it simply, a sinking fund is a sort of separate bucket or bank account or envelope for your money where you put money aside for a specific purpose to be spent later on. It's not like an emergency fund where it just sits there until it's like called upon like Batman. It's more specific than that. It's your car needs to have the oil changed and you just take that money out of your auto sinking fund versus having to adjust the family budget. It's same with vacation. Instead of, you know, trying to make a vacation happen within your budget, you just set a little bit aside from every paycheck to save up for the vacation. Same with Christmas. It comes from the accounting term sunk cost, which is where you're not going to like recoup these costs later on. Like this mm-hmm. is not like an investment where you're going to make money on this. No, it's like it's sitting in this account for a designated purpose to be spent and go bye bye. And then you'll have to replenish it later on. OK, so I'm curious how you came about using them. Did you like have it recommended to you? Have you been doing it for a while? What's your history on implementing the idea <laughs> of sinking funds in your own budget? So I had never even heard of the term sinking funds. I'd heard of sunk costs because I was an accountant, but it actually happened about a year after my husband and I had gotten married. So we got engaged in 2008. And like two weeks after we got engaged, my husband lost his job because of the Great Recession. Sure. So my husband started his own, like his first business, which was like a small little handyman business. And it was going great. And then he took his truck to go have some like regular maintenance done on it at a mechanic. And then all of a sudden his truck wasn't working right. And we just couldn't figure out what was going on with it. I mean, we spent just over $5,000 trying to fix his truck. And this is before we were debt free or anything. So all this was like on a credit card. um, And it was just insane. And I'm like, why are we spending so much money on this? Totally turned out that like some like, (laughs) some really kind older gentleman at um, the local biscuit joint actually like took my like popped my husband's hood, took apart a hose, did like this and like a piece of the mechanics rag actually fell out of the hose. And that was the problem. No joke. That was the problem. Spent $5,000 because there was like a piece of a rag and a hose somewhere. But so I decided at that point, I'm like, this can't keep happening. Like my car needed an oil change. I'm like, I should be able to pay for an oil change in my car. Like this is like part of car ownership. You have to change oil in your car. And so I was trying to figure out how to make this work because we were also newlyweds. So it's like, how do we manage money together? And so I came up with this idea of just opening up a separate bank account. And it just started with the auto fund. That was it. And so I I actually remember the exact amount that I budgeted every month was $75 every month to go into this fund. And it was just going to be there to take care of any car maintenance things. And I set this goal of like, okay, well, I wanted to have enough to put a brand new set of tires on my husband's truck or my car. That was my goal. And so that's what I now refer to as like a threshold amount in a sinking fund is the minimum amount that you want to have in that account. And then that's all you need to save. And then you just move on to something else. So you started with an auto fund. How many do you have now? How many sinking funds do you use now? Hold on, give me a second. I didn't think to count that. Uh, let's see. Five. Okay. Five that we regularly use. Yeah. Okay. And every month you're putting something into them or only looking at that threshold amount to know if an account needs added more? So only looking at the threshold amount, the only one that doesn't have, or the only two that don't have like super sudden stone threshold amounts is the vacation and Christmas fund. Typically, because we just save kind of all year for those. And those like savings amounts are really small. Like right now, we're just putting $5 in the Christmas sinking fund every paycheck. Mm-hmm. So it's not very much. But, you know, anytime that we use the auto account and it dips below our current threshold, then that kind of becomes the priority. Is the same whenever we use our kids sinking fund because I homeschool my kids. And so we have had, I've had to buy curriculum or they need clothes or we're paying the sports fees because that's insane. And that comes out of that fund. And then we have to replenish that one. So those ones have more of a set in stone threshold than the Christmas and the vacation ones. So how do you decide if someone wants to have a sinking fund, but they haven't even started, how do you decide what your monthly deposit is going to be into that sinking fund? I would first look to come up with what your threshold is, because then you know what your end goal is. And this can be any number amount. Like uh, sometimes I think people overthink this. They think they have to have thousands and thousands of dollars. It can be $200. Mm-hmm. It can be whatever you need it to be. But come up with that threshold amount and then take an honest look at your budget and see, okay, well, how much can we spare from the budget currently? Like what's realistic? I mean, obviously we can make adjustments and we can cut spending here and there to make more wiggle room, but what is realistic? And then how much time is that going to take to reach that particular sinking funds threshold limit? 
I think like a Christmas one is kind of easy to do because you're like at any point in the year, you know exactly how far away Christmas is, right? Unlike a car maintenance where it's like at any point it could pop up. You can you can say you go to crank your car and the battery doesn't. Yep, it doesn't doesn't matter. It doesn't work anymore. Started that sinking fund. But like for Christmas, anybody who's listening who wanted to try it, I think that's a kind of a good one to start because you could say if you want to have, you know, twelve hundred dollars for Christmas, well, it's February, so that's ten months from now, so that's one twenty a month. So it's pretty easy math to be able to divvy that up. So one of the common questions I had, I put up a box about the sinking funds today and had a lot of people write in their wanderings because I said if you want to know something about sinking funds, let's ask Jesse because I don't really know. One of the things that came up was. Where do you actually put the the sinking fund? So some people were like, is it cash? Is it its own separate savings account? Is it all lumped into one saving account? Like where what do you actually do with that money? So for my family, we have separate bank accounts for the majority of our sinking funds. This just makes it easier to manage money on my end because, you know, it's not just me. I'm managing with my husband as well. And so it just makes it more simple because each sort of bucket of money is labeled for what its purpose actually is. So that makes it a little bit easier and it makes it easier to track and then I don't have to do as much bookkeeping on my end. I will say that when we're doing a shorter term project, like a couple of years ago, we decided to do all new landscaping in our front yard. And so we decided we were just going to set aside cash in an envelope until we had what we felt was a reasonable amount of money. And so and then we just used that to do that project. And then we just deposited anything that was extra to wherever we felt it needed to go. So it can really work however it works best for others. You know, if it was just me and I was only managing money myself and I didn't wasn't sharing money with my husband, I could totally have it sitting in one account and just have a spreadsheet that said what everything was for. But because it's not just me, the system of having several sort of bank accounts and buckets of money Mm -hmm. makes a little bit more sense for us. But I think it's a little bit of trial and error and just seeing, okay, what works best, what works best for me and what works best for my husband and where can we come together and, and figure out that sort of common ground. I think even in the last, like, I would say five years, I feel like there's so many more options now for online banking tools that let you organize yes. and divide and name the accounts and all that kind of stuff, which can make it so easy. So I use Ally for that. And I know like Capital One does similar, CIT Bank does similar. Um, But I think it's so helpful to not have to either keep mental track of what should be going where. But then also I find like if I just had a giant savings account and it was just called savings and I was like, oh, there's like six or seven different reasons for that. It would feel easy to like pull money from it because it would be like, oh, it's just a big savings account. But I know for me personally, like having an account with the name emergency fund or with the name vacation it really makes me pause and be like, do you really want to pull money out of that for something else? (laughs) Yeah, Because this is the name of it. (laughs) So I think that organization can kind of help not just make it simpler to keep track of, but also give me a good amount of like, check yourself before you pull this money out. Is that really what it's for? (laughs) And I think a lot of times when I say that I have like a bunch of savings accounts, I think people think that that would be more work. I have totally found the reverse to be true. I think having more accounts organized by name is so much less work because it's just like when I log in and I look at what the bank accounts have, it's just like your car fund has this much in it and your emergency fund has this much in it. And so it's like, I don't have to do any extra tracking outside of it, which is kind of what you were explaining too. Yes. Like your bank account tells you what's in there. Yeah. There's no guessing. Like when it comes to Christmas time, like I don't have to guess what the budget's going to be because it's literally what's sitting in the Christmas sinking fund. <laughs> I have for sure found more accounts to be less work instead of the opposite to be true. What happens if you have an expense out of that sinking fund and there's not enough in the sinking fund to cover what the expense would be? So let's say like your auto, let's say that happened with your auto sinking fund. So for my family, that's when the emergency fund kicks in, especially if it's not something that the regular budget can cover. If it's like a hundred bucks or less than our regular budget, we could just adjust some things and, and make it work there. But if it's a significant amount of money, then it would just come from our emergency fund and we would just, the way we would go. And I mean, and that actually happened last year. My car needed some major repairs and it needed more repairs than what was in the auto fund. And so some of it had to come from our emergency fund. But, you know, it's it's even more motivating, I feel like, to then have to replenish that account because it's sitting at zero and I don't want it to sit at zero. So it's it's incredibly motivating. (laughs) Do you use what is in there first and then just take the rest out of the emergency fund? 
Yes. Yeah. That's uh, always the first line of defense is the sinking funds for us. And then the emergency fund is what would kick in. Cool. So three different people asked the exact same question. How many (laughs) sinking funds is too many? How do you know if you're like over organizing your money? Yeah. I mean, I don't know that there's a specific number because everybody's needs are different. But I think that if we get too into the weeds with it, then it is too much because I have certainly had too many before. And then I realized, mm-hmm. okay, like this is kind of silly that some of these, my threshold amount is like only a hundred bucks. Like this is silly. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I need a sinking fund for this. And so I kind of set up little rules for myself of like, if it is less than a hundred bucks, I don't need a sinking fund for it. It'll just have mm-hmm. to come from the regular budget. I'll have to, you know, move some things around and figure it out, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of started with that. And I, and I would say, you know, for others to maybe do the same thing, that if your threshold amount is going to be less than, say, $100, and you could finagle that in your budget relatively easily, then mm-hmm. don't set a sinking fund for it. But if it is something that would cost you a little bit more money, then maybe consider setting up a sinking fund. I always tell people, I'm like, think about the, think about the thing that when it happens and you know you should really expect it, because again, we mm-hmm. keep talking about cars, but it's like, you know, you know that you should expect that your car is going to need maintenance or even minor repairs, like we talked about before with like a dead car battery or something. Like, you know those things could happen. So you should right. kind of expect them, right? So it's like, Think about that because I know for me, like I've gone out in my car before, gone and crank it, the battery is dead and then I got to go buy a $150 car battery. And if you don't have the money for that, that is detrimental to you. So if mm-hmm. those, if, if something like that has been detrimental to you in the past, maybe consider setting that kind of expense up as a sinking fund. I know sometimes I build budgets for people where I do kind of feel like they have too many, where it's like they have the best intentions of yeah. that kind of thinking of, okay, Think of all the contingencies of what might pop up. But then if your sinking fund list is 20 things long, even if you're only putting $10, $20 a month into each of those, the two things I often see going together are someone has a bunch of sinking funds and one of their highest frustrations is they feel like they're not getting anywhere with their goals, like their bigger goals, like an emergency fund or saving up to buy a house or whatever it is. And so it's like, well, if we take however much extra anybody has that gap between their income and expenses, if I had to take my gap between my income and expenses and divvy it up in 20 different directions, I wouldn't make a whole lot of progress on my bigger goals either. So I do think I like what you're saying. It's important to kind of triage those those really big ones that are not only when they do happen, they're larger, but also they're like the most probable ones. Yes. Like they're the ones that we're going to see the most frequently. And then for me... If somebody has like an underfunded starter emergency fund, I would really pare down the sinking fund list until we can get that initial emergency fund really beefed up at least to like a month of expenses or so. And then we can kind of be like, okay, now how do I want to add multiple layers of protection to this? But without that first starter emergency fund, that takes a priority. I absolutely agree. Absolutely. Because I mean, like I said, for us, like our sinking funds are our first line of defense, but the, you know, the emergency fund is the big guns, right? Like that's, that's right. The, the big mamma jamma. And so you want to make sure that you have that sort of emergency fund done first before you start trying to set up sinking funds. Yeah. Yeah. For the smaller stuff, you know, like clothes or, you know, yes. those kind of things. <laughs> Okay, somebody has a really good question. Any advice for not using it for what it's not there for when we see it sitting there and we feel like it's basically free money that we could spend? Any advice for leaving it there until it is actually needed? Again, I think it just goes back to the goals. Like what like what's the goal of the account? What is it that you're wanting to spend it on? Like what's tempting you and why is that thing tempting you so much? Because it's not to say that I've never borrowed from sinking funds before because I have. And there have been times where it was sort of justified where maybe there was mm-hmm. a bigger expense than we thought for something else. And so we took from another sinking fund to cover it. Mm-hmm. You know, but you do have to just kind of check your own behavior and ask yourself, why is it like what is tempting me to want to spend this money? What am I wanting to spend it on? And is it worth taking from this particular sinking fund. I also sometimes use them. If it's something where it's like, ooh, that's an unexpected expense, but it's not an emergency, then I'll kind of look at what I have. And and again, I don't really, I don't use sinking funds in terms of repeatedly adding money to things, but I do them more in what I call saving sprints, where I'm like, if I'm, you know, three to six months away from a specific trip in mind, then I'll start to sprint to the finish line of saving up for that. And I will use a separate account for that. And I do also default to like, oh, if 
if it just feels like that sinking fund has a little extra padding than it needs and something unexpected came up, even if it's like an unexpected school expense and I'm pulling a little bit of money from a vacation fund, like I'm fine with that as opposed to obviously either taking on debt or like pulling from the emergency fund for something yeah. like that. So I think it does take practice too. And and like, I think what you're kind of getting at is knowing your why, like, why are you having that sinking fund there? It's to protect you from an unexpected expense. Well, if I use it for something else, then have the unexpected expense, I'm going to really be wishing that I hadn't done that. So it's <laughs> exactly. like, we have to, we have to be more interested in protecting ourselves against those unexpected expenses than we are in buying whatever that thing is we're tempted to get in the moment. Okay, some people said, do you use them frequently enough that you put it in a checking account or do you have all of them in a savings account? So our Christmas fund is a checking account. That's actually the only one that's a checking account. We tried having the vacation one as a checking account, but I that didn't work very well just because I was too worried that we were going to forget the debit card or something because it wasn't one that we used all the time. And I didn't want that to mm -hmm. happen while we weren't anywhere near home. So, but our Christmas one, that is a separate checking account, but all the other ones are savings accounts. Savings. Cool. High yield savings. Yes. <laughs> cool. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. nice. <laughs> that was, that was what the, the question was specifically HYSA. <laughs> so we've touched on this a little bit. If I wanted to add sinking funds to my budget, how would I decide what's a sinking fund and what can just fit within my budget? I think it just goes back to really analyzing the expenses in the past that have caused the most stress and the most heartache, you know, whether it's the auto expenses or if it's all of a sudden finding out that, you know, your kid's been invited to seven birthday parties in one weekend, mm -hmm. you know, they want to go to all these birthday parties or these all these field trips or whatever it is. Because I know with my kids, when they were in public school, we had those moments where it was like, I mean, field trip after field trip, and then we're having mm -hmm. to pay for this and that. And I'm like, oh my goodness gracious, what am I going to do? And so we weren't really prepared. And I mean, easily between three kids, I mean, we were spending a lot of money that way. So that's when I actually set up a, a sinking fund just for them that I was like, okay, this is where the, that money is going to come from. Mm -hmm. So it just really comes down to kind of identifying those pain points and being like, okay, well, you know, how can we mitigate this from causing catastrophe in the future? And, yeah. and again, it, it depends on everybody's budget because for some people, you know, $100 is a catastrophe and for others, it's $1,000 mm -hmm. that's a catastrophe. So you just right. kind of have to define that for yourself. I think the important question to ask is exactly what you said of like, what has been causing me stress? If occasionally buying shoes for your kids has not caused stress in your budget, you probably don't need a shoes and clothing sinking fund. But if you can look back and say, oh, if I, if I had to put the main stressors in my unexpected expenses into a couple categories, it was car and kids and home or whatever it yeah. is like those should be your first sinking funds then those are good areas to then it like it helps you identify if i would have had a sinking fund that would have felt different that would have been a different experience yes. so when you use money out of your sinking fund how do you actually go about that once you find out what the expense is going to be do you transfer money from the saving to the checking account first or do you just go ahead and pay for it out of your checking and then reimburse yourself because I think sometimes, especially if people are trying to move away from overly using credit cards, they're, they are curious but kind of have a hesitation about how would I actually like access and use that money. For us, it depends. It depends if the money is less than what our buffer in our checking account is. I know you talk about the mm -hmm. buffer a lot. So if it's less than what yep. the buffer is, like I'm fine to go ahead and pay it and then just pay ourselves back. But if it's more, mm -hmm. then no, I transfer it first and then pay it. Because you're right, it is like weird going from having that credit card and ha being able to spend it to not having one. And I haven't had mm -hmm. one in a very long time. So, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, so it's like I always forget that making that jump can be difficult. I've gone both directions. I've gone from using a credit card and then I stopped for nine years and then now I've started again. <laughs> and so I think there's times for all of that. Yes, So absolutely. if people are like, yes, I have been overly using the credit card and it's causing me to overspend and I'm interested in not using a credit card. But some of these just mechanics of how it would actually work are are a hang up for me deciding to actually take the plunge into using a debit card all the time. I think it's good to hear from people who are doing that like you to be like, oh, yeah, like I nothing bad would actually happen if I had to use my debit card for this or like with a car, for example, you can go take your car to the mechanic and get it fixed. And there's probably a couple days between when you know that it's broken yes. and when you actually have to pay when they're fixing it. And so you're going to have time to like move that around, decide where you want to pull the money from. 
especially medical stuff. Like you could get surgery before you even know yes. what the bill is going to be and stuff. So there's very, very, very few unexpected expenses where from the moment you find out that you have it to the moment you actually have to like swipe your card and pay for it is like seconds or minutes or whatever. That almost never happens. Exactly. I like I honestly, I'm saying you're trying to think I'm like, <laughs> have I ever had one of those moments where I had to like pay right then and there? I really don't think that I have. Like I've always had yeah. a little bit of time to m manage that. Yeah. And even if it is like a towing bill on the side of the road or whatever, it's still I've even done things where it's like I can write a check because I know that by the time they cash it, I will have already transferred the money or even like, you know, I can pull the Ally app up on my phone and pull money from the savings account into the checking account if I need to. If someone wanted to use cash envelopes, has this been something you've ever done in the past? And could you share your experience, maybe pros and cons of deciding, it's, especially if they're one of those people where like they're trying to get away from the whole credit card thing, what would be some pros and cons of actually physically using cash for some of these things? I have done the cash envelope system. We actually did that for quite a few years. I think it works really, really good, especially I I feel like because I'm a saver, so not a spender, but my husband is a spender and he likes having the cash more mm -hmm. than like having the debit card because he doesn't spend as much. Like he's more aware of what he's spending when it's in cash. And I think it's easier to track it too, because you do become more aware when you have that cash with you. And then of course you're aware if you're like pulling from other envelopes to borrow money that you're taking money, you know, you're taking grocery money to go buy your Starbucks coffee or whatever mm -hmm. it is. So you're just more aware of what you're doing with your money. And so I do think that especially if you're going from credit cards to trying to not have credit cards, that doing the cash envelope system is a fantastic way of doing that because it really does force you to have to get very real with where that money's going. Because I do feel that there's a huge disconnect nowadays with our money because so much of our money is kind of invisible. You know, m many mm -hmm. of us don't even write paper checks anymore to pay our bills. We do everything on a line. And so there's a bit of a disconnect. And so I do think that to get re re reacquainted with our money, being able to have that cash is a powerful tool. Yeah, it's certainly an awareness booster, especially, you know, if you see that envelope and you see the bills at the start of the pay period or the start of the month, and then you see them physically disappear. It's just a different it's certainly a different feeling. It's something about holding it in your hands and having to actually turn it over and not get anything back as opposed to a card that, like you said, I think it's invisible money where at, at a certain point it starts to lose its connection with reality where you're like, oh, you just swipe this plastic thing and then you get stuff and then like that's the end of the road. That's all that happens. Exactly. That's it. <laughs> the fairy so, godmother has shown. I was going to say, it'd be so <laughs> wonderful if it happened that way. Do you know of any budget tools or apps that budget with sinking funds? I don't like the YNAB one or the every dollar one. Have you ever seen a tool other than those that could actually track a sinking fund? I have not. I mean, I know that Allie, as you mentioned earlier, has where you can do like the, don't they call it buckets? Isn't buckets, it buckets yep. on? Yeah, where the, you can do like the different buckets, but that's not really a budgeting app. So I, to be honest, no, just because I'm more of the pen and paper and spreadsheet type of girl that, you know, that's what I prefer. <laughs> the apps are good, too. But yeah, I don't know of one that will do the sinking funds for you. So I think that's all for the Q&A. So some of the things that I'm curious about are how has the way that you've used sinking funds changed over time? Like, if you've been using it for a while, are there any things that you can think of where you're like, oh, I was gung-ho about doing it like this when I first started. And now that I have more experience under my belt and more uh, times of actually using them, now I do it differently. Anything that's changed from the time you started to now? Yes. So I always have felt weird if I stop contributing to a sinking fund. Like even if it's reached its threshold limit, I feel really weird not putting money there anymore. Like I feel like something's wrong and then I struggle really hard. And so I've had to learn that before any adjustments are made, like I have to sit down and really prioritize where the money that was going to that sinking fund, like where is it going now? How is it going to benefit us in the future? Instead of just being like, oh, I don't know what to do with this now. And I don't know what I want to take it from here. But, you know, it, like I said, at some point you have to stop contributing to a specific sinking fund because you're going to end up having too much money in there. And then you're not having enough money to do other things like investing, which is actually where we decided that any extra money would go into either the IRAs or the brokerage account. So over time, you feel like you've gotten better at being OK with stopping so that you can focus on other goals. Yes, yes. And like I said, it's, uh, that's always so hard for me. And I don't know why. I think it's, again, just because I'm a natural saver. And so I yeah. feel weird 
if I'm like taking away from like a pot of money, you know, like this is when I see it, but you know, and I feel like I'm supposed to do something different with like, oh, well, I need to come up with a new goal for this, but I don't Mm -hmm. necessarily have a new goal, if that makes any sense. Yeah, for sure. So what are some of the, if if people are imagining themselves using sinking funds and trying to kind of wrap their heads around how it would be helpful, we've hit on cars a lot. What are some non-car things where you're like, oh, this is a couple of times where I was so thankful that I had a sinking fund? Home maintenance, if you own your own home, definitely have a home maintenance sinking fund because home maintenance is something you have to do every single year. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like every year you have to do it. You know, you got to buy, you know, HVAC filters and all kinds of stuff. So you definitely want a home maintenance sinking fund um, to help pay for all the maintenance things that need to happen in your house. You know, I talked about kids, pets, if you have pets, Christmas, of course, vacations, medical, education. So if you're trying to go back to school or you are in school, but you know you get to pay for textbooks or anything like that, or for your children even, maybe an educational seeking fund. The reality is just whatever makes the most sense for your life. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Last question. Do you ever front load a sinking fund? Like if you were to get a tax refund or, you know, even just like a Christmas bonus do you ever say like hey we'll just drop all this in here and then this would be full or would you more heavily prioritize your other goals like investing and just keep on the like low slow consistent sinking fund deposit route i mean if it was just my money i would just totally throw it all into savings and all of my savings goals but it's not just my money so we have to divvy it up so mm-hmm. some of it will get spent and then others will absolutely get front loaded into any sinking fund that needs to have like kind of that startup cost, if you will. I think it's it's a good time to ask things like that at, in this season right now, because I think a lot of people are either, I don't know if people are getting their refund yet, but they're certainly close. Yeah, they are because the IRS like paused like when you could file, like they weren't letting people file letting, until I think I like know. January 31st. I think <laughs> it, it gets later every year, I feel like. But anyways, regardless, <laughs> people people who tend to get a refund are close to receiving that. So I think that would be a good thing to think about if you know that you are going to get a refund somewhat, you know, in the next couple of months. Maybe think about those categories that have been consistent stressors for you and think, like, even if I took a really small percentage wise portion of that tax refund and jump started a car repair fund and a kids fund, how much better would I feel going into the spring, going into the summer? Um, that instead of having to finagle my budget to figure out those things, that there was already something there with that name on it. And I think that's the big thing, the big draw of the sinking funds is that people have such a hard time pulling money out of savings if it's just called a general savings. Like, especially I'm not a natural saver, but for someone who is a natural saver, I think if if you don't have a specific purpose in mind, it can feel like you're doing something wrong if you pull money out of a savings account where people have it in their head. You know, like we were told as kids, like transfer 10% of your income to savings always. And it was just called savings. And we were never told like what to actually do with it or like- We were never given a strategy. We were never told what that was supposed to look like. (laughs) I think in my head, I was like, you put it there and you like never use it. You never touch it. Yes, you can't touch it. (laughs) And it's like, why? That just feels like giving yourself a 10% pay cut. But I think flipping that around and having actual names on it, so instead of having it just be called a general savings, calling it a car fund, then when something happens to your car and you have to withdraw money from savings, it actually feels like you're doing exactly what you wanted to do instead of that you're somehow taking away from something. And I think that's the big mindset shift that comes with saving of any kind, but specifically with sinking funds, is that it's functionally at the end of the day, it's identical. Whether I had an account that just was called savings and all my money went in there and then I pulled money out to get a car battery, or if I organized it into a bunch of different categories with names on it and then I pulled money out of the car fund for a battery, those are functionally identical things, but they feel totally different because they feel like I prepared for this exact expense and now I know where this is coming from. And you don't have to feel like you're taking away from something in order to do something very normal, like take care of your car or your house or your kids. So I think that's a big attraction, certainly for people who are like, how do I make sense out of wanting to feel better with my money and not knowing what's actually going to achieve that versus just spinning my wheels and not actually getting anywhere? 
I, I agree. It's it's permission to spend the money whenever you need it. <laughs> yeah. So like I said, I'm not personally a huge sinking fund user, but I highly see the value. I, I see the purpose in them and I see how they can be beneficial for organizing your uh, money in that way so that you don't feel as stressed when those expenses come around. Because like you said, it's not like you don't know when it's going to happen, but it is going to happen. It shouldn't be a surprise. Exactly. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Jesse, can you tell our listeners a little bit about what you do and where they can find you if they want to learn more about sinking funds and all the other good stuff that you talk about? Absolutely. So I'm the author of Getting Good with Money, which is a book that's not just about money. It shares my family's story of becoming debt-free on my husband's $47,000 a year salary. And in it includes a whole section on sinking funds and goes kind of into the nitty gritty of how we developed the sinking fund system to benefit our family and details the story and shares how other folks can learn to manage their money well in order to experience the freedom that my family has been blessed with as a result of finally figuring out and getting good with money. But folks can find me on Instagram at jessiefearon and they can find me at my website at jessiefearon.com. Awesome. And I just want to note that she says they're debt free and it includes the mortgage. So they are fully yes, debt free. So it does. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being willing to share on something that I had no expertise on, but I knew that you were the expert. <laughs> so I wanted you to come and do that for us. Well, thank you for having me. Welcome to another segment of Not Worth Your Money, where Carly and I will discuss if something is worth, you know, forking over the cash for. Today's segment is something that I've been more and more interested in recently. I actually have this thing open on a tab on my phone. You had jokingly asked me earlier today, like, is there anything I shouldn't see on your phone? <laughs> and I said no, but that was not the truth because I was saving this to talk about for not worth your money. <laughs> I used his phone to Google the kid's lunch calendar and I just like jokingly said, is there anything you want me to know about <laughs> on your phone? <laughs> what do you want me to know about thing on your phone? <laughs> is a Meat grinder attachment for your KitchenAid. I've been more interested in doing some of that, like cooking. Can I, and, can and I stuff give the context home. for this? Please. <laughs> Two nights ago, we watched an episode of what's it called? Dinner. What's the show? Dinner Time Live. Dinner Time Live. And they used a KitchenAid attachment meat grinder. And I just knew <laughs> that. <laughs> that how recently Kyle has been diving into going from I cook all of the food and occasionally he can throw a dinner together to like wanting to be a cook, which is great. It's is great. it though? <laughs> great. So, um, <laughs> but I we, we were making dinner last night and I was trying to think of some potato dish to throw together and she's like, We don't have time to do anything fancy. I'm just putting it together. <laughs> okay. So I do like that you're getting more involved in the kitchen but we're taking fundamentally different approaches to it shocking shocking and i am all about trying like the different methods that you read about in salt fat acid heat or that you see on something but again a thursday at 5 45 p.m when the kids have not eaten is not the time to start googling for recipes like if you had a recipe and you were like this is what i'm making they would be like okay but i can in the time that you would have still been like on the landing page of google trying to decide which recipe you wanted to click on i already had the potatoes prepped and so that is the that's the rub yes. between the two. Yes. The two philosophies is that out of necessity, I have learned that there are times to just get food on the table. And there are times like a Saturday morning breakfast where I'm like, let's try a new pastry recipe or something. There's times for each of them. And so I do have a little bit of not a protective, but like a here, let me step in. I've been doing this yeah. for a while. Let's get yeah. the potatoes in the oven. <laughs> so, okay, meat grinder attachment. I, I do on a also want to say that I had I've had that tab open with the thing on my phone for before, about two weeks before we watched. The well, episode. before okay. that episode, it was more just confirmation okay. that it was cool and I want to try it. I find raw meat to be disgusting, <laughs> and I want to interact with it as little as possible. 
So even like watching that episode and having him talk about how like it was different cuts of meat and he was just like putting them all in there and it was spitting out different things. And sometimes it was the muscle and sometimes it was the fat. Like that's repulsive to me. So I, if you want to get that, it would be like getting an electric guitar. I'm not going to touch it or <laughs> do anything with it. But that doesn't mean that I need to say no to you. Why are you interested in it? We like to make burgers fairly often. And I've been, you know, working on perfecting a burger recipe. Um, perfecting? Perfecting. You know, mm. it's, and you'll never reach it, but <laughs> it's, it's a work in progress. I've been intentionally trying to make them better, I guess. Okay. I accept. And I think part of that is choosing different cuts of meat to combine yourself mm. so you can have the right amount of lean and fat mm. and all that. So I like the idea of trying that out, kind of experimenting. Um, yeah. And then what's the chef's name? David Chang. Yeah. He's the one that did the episode. Yeah. It was very interesting for to listen to him talk about burgers and say that 70 30 is the ideal fat ratio and that you can't even like buy that right. in the grocery store. Like I, I know 75 25 is the or no. Is that what? Yeah. Yeah. 75 25 Aldi has, which that's actually very close, close yeah. yeah but he was saying that that was why that was one of the reasons that he was grinding his own meat for his burgers was that you can't buy the ideal ratio already made and then he was also putting like i think he said like brisket and like mm -hmm. like several very different cuts of meat and he was like when you buy ground chuck at the grocery store you don't even know which cuts of meat they're using so i yeah. i get and, it. and it's a little healthier because when you buy pre-ground beef or pre-ground meat at the store, the, it's been through all of the grinder already. And so it's like it has a lot of surface area, a lot more opportunity for bacterial mm -hmm. growth and stuff like that. Or mm -hmm. if you're doing that at home. Yeah, you know, you're taking a whole chunk. Yeah, yeah, and you're doing it fresh and you're doing it right yeah. away. So, I mean, that's marginal. but mm -hmm. How much is does that attachment cost? Brand new for like a KitchenAid brand is a hundred, but there's knockoff ones and eBay, eBay and whatever. Yeah. So. I'm not opposed to it. It's it is a as I imagine it being part of our kitchen. It's like one more reason that the dinner is going to take even longer <laughs> to make. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. It's a weekend thing. It's a weekend. It's not a. Weekend. It's a weekend grinder. <laughs> no, I'm gonna scratch that. Scr if you hear that audio in this episode, it'll be a miracle. Carly will not have approved. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, this has been Not Worth Your Money, where we talk about if something is worth the money. And we just made a purchase decision <laughs> on this podcast. So Apparently, some of our money is going to a KitchenAid meat grinder. <laughs> you got to listen in on how we make decisions about buying stuff. Live decision making. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, see you next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Debt Free Mom podcast. If you want to join me as a guest on the show, go to dfmpodcast.com. The Debt Free Mom podcast is hosted by me, Carly Hill, and is produced, edited, and mixed by Kyle Hill. Music for this episode was written by Kyle Hill. Hit subscribe wherever you're listening to join in with every new episode as we grow our confidence and contentment in our personal finances. 